Um, this is impressive. I just wanted to ask everyone to move to the front, but I think it's not possible anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you all for joining my talk about Fearless Embedded Rust. Um, I'm Martin Mosler. I work for Zilke Engineering in Switzerland. And my company and I, uh, we basically see the potential of Rust in future development projects, especially in embedded projects. Um, and that's why the company also supports me in uh, supporting the community, for example, with Rust meetups, giving the talk here. So thanks to my company, I'm here today. And I'm also building up internal Rust knowledge at our company that we can do more projects in the future when they come. Um, today I talk about a private project that I have done in the last months. It's about an IoT temperature measurement device. Um, I will do some live demo here. I stripped it down a little bit that it fits into our time that we have av available today. And I hope that we will also have some time at the end to, uh, that you can ask some questions. So let's start by looking at the hardware that I have chosen for my project. I've looked at the internet, what boards are well supported by, by the community. And one very promising choice was the ESP32C3 chip uh, on the DevKit M1 board. That's what I have available here on my desk. Exactly the same setup that you can see on the screen. And I've chosen it, as I said, for all the resources that you can find on the internet. You find articles, you find libraries, uh, everything. Or well, that was my impression, at least. Everything that I need to get started. It's based on a RISC-V processor, which basically means I don't have to work with a proprietary tool chain. I can install Clang LLVM and get uh, my code compiled for this architecture. It comes with Wi-Fi support, which was important to me. I wanted to send out my measurements to a server, collect it, and then uh, display it. And the hope was if Wi-Fi is integrated into the chip, I can easily get it working. And spoiler alert, it was really the case. So it was just a few lines of code. And it's pretty inexpensive. All the components that you see in the screen are about 10 euro total, if you find a cheap supplier. And what is also quite important is the availability. I mean, you probably know how difficult it was to get a Raspberry Pi over the last two years. And with this board, it was no problem to, to order them and get them shipped. And finally, there's also a lot of uh, storage space available on this board. I only use up to one megabyte at the moment, but it gives me the possibility to have a software update over the air at the end and also to use it uh, to store my data that I don't have to go online for each me measurement again. So, what do you think is the first application that we are going to develop with a new language? <laughs> it's Hello World. <laughs> And that's what we are going to do now. So we create a Hello World application, compile it, uh, link it, uh, deploy it to the target, and run it. And uh, you will see that this is a very simple task with all the support that we get from the community already. Uh, when you install the Rust tool chain, it comes with a lot of different tools. And one quite important tool is Cargo. Cargo is like a build tool. If you come from C++, it's like CMake. Um, it's also a dependency management tool. Again, my comparison with C++ would be Conan, for example. And it's much more. You can even create your own additions to the tool. And in this case, uh, I installed an addition called Generate, which allows me to create a new project based on a template project. And let's have a quick look. Uh, Good, I can still type my password. So, um, so we can do our cargo generate. And then I have already downloaded the template um, to my computer, so I can use a pass instead of a link to GitHub. And it's called like this. And then you specify basically what kind of project you are creating. Uh, I chose Cargo. Uh, you can also select CMake, but I don't see the reason for using CMake in a, a Rust project. Give it a name. Hello, world. Oh. 
Okay, I tried this before. Hello, Rustations. And then it asked me if I want to choose the uh, default values. That's true. Then I can select the CPU that I'm using. I can select uh, all the expressive CPUs here. Uh, I have the C3, as I said, the RISC V processor, and that's it. And if we look at the Hello Rustations project, you see there are only a few files being generated. There's the main file with the Hello World application and uh, the cargo.toml, which is basically the project description that you need for building it. The other parts, um, we don't have to look at them at the moment, but basically they configure the cross-compilation tool chain. And um, I will not build this one now, but I will go into my presentations directory. I have also uh, currently Hello World here, but I extended the application with a few log messages. You can see here, this is the main function. Um, when we build this application, it has already some kind of firmware uh, installed. It will finally initialize the board and set everything up and, find, and at the end uh, go into my main function. And this is all that we need for the Hello World. So we ignore this line. It's just fixing up some runtime issues. Uh, it initializes the logger, and then I can send different log messages uh, out to somewhere. And we will see where somewhere is in a second. So I put in an info message, a warning message, and an error that you can see it. So what do I have to do um, to, to uh, compile and um, install it and run it? I can do it all in one step with the cargo runs. It will implicitly build the application, link it, and flash it. All the tools are in installed. And I select that I want to do a release build. It will be a little bit smaller, and it takes less uh, time to flash it to the target for us. Um, yeah, my mistake. I have to connect the um, USB port to my VP, USB cable to my VM. Here we go. So I can select now TTY USB 0. And it was already compiled. That was the reason why I chose my directory. Otherwise, it would download all the dependencies and uh, compile them for us, and this takes some time. Um, while this is downloading the program to the flash, uh, I will briefly go to my slides and show you what it takes to install the toolchain. Uh, we won't do this now, it's already done. There's a nice project called RustUp. Uh, on the website, you find a command which you can use to install all the tools that you need to start uh, developing Rust uh, for yourself. And for the cross-compilation of the Espressive, you basically need to install some depe dependencies that the tools need. Uh, for my Fedora VM, I had to install these parts. I had to register the USB device uh, with UDEV so that it gets detected. And finally, install the cargo extensions, like the cargo generate plugin that I just used, or the flashing tool um, that is being used to program the flash on the, on the target. So in the meanwhile, it has compiled, uh, it has flashed the application to the target and booted. And we also, it switched basically to a serial console afterwards, so we get all the log messages from our application um, in this nice terminal. You see it's color-coded, that's pretty nice. We have an indication if it's an info message, a warning, and an error with color coding, so you can detect uh, your errors uh, pretty easily. It also has some time code, so it, it takes about 300 milliseconds to boot and initialize everything up. And then finally, after 300 milliseconds, it will enter the main function uh, where our Hello World um, program was. So, but now we want to have a look at what we are going to develop. So, in this demo, I want to connect a temperature sensor. I have chosen this DS18B20. Uh, it uses a one-wire protocol, and it, I have chosen it because it just uses a few pins. It needs the power supply, it needs the ground, and the communication pin. And the nice thing about the sensor is you can plug multiple of them in parallel. It's a bus system, and uh, you don't have to change any hardware if you want to have two temperature measurements, or three, or four. Uh, I also indicated, basically, that um, you can put an external power supply to it. So for my project, I put in three uh, AA batteries on the 5-volt and the ground pins. and um, 
Finally, when I have uh, this board deployed in my garden, um, it will run up to three weeks now. So that's pretty good. There's still room for improvement. It will, this will come over the next weeks. Um, by the way, this is a pretty nice website where I uh, have drawn this schematic Rockby. Um, it basically allows you also to write small programs there in different languages and simulate it on the internet. And I should also be po uh, able to upload my image to this website, and then I can simulate uh, my Rust application with a virtual device on the internet. But I haven't tried this for my application because it's getting a little bit more complicated than a Hello World. And finally, when I have deployed my application, I see on a small uh, web page uh, the temperature curve over three days here. Um, and I also installed basically a voltage divider to monitor the battery uh, voltage because I don't want to deep charge my batteries when they are deployed in the garden. So we will now look uh, what it takes to, uh, to do the measurement of the temperature and output it um, to our console. We will do a small optimization to save uh, energy because without that, uh, the batteries run down within one day and I don't want to change the batteries every 20 hours uh, because this will also be sometimes at night. And finally, we will connect uh, to Wi-Fi hotspot and send the measurement out into the cloud. So, since I cannot type that fast, I have prepared different versions. So, I do a good checkout of the first version, which is the temperature measurement. And I will also do in the background already a compilation and the programming to the flash because I want um, to save some time for explaining the code. So this is now the main, uh, main function after I have applied my changes. And again, it's not that big, it fits on the screen. Um, up till here, it's the same. Uh, what we need to communicate with the temperature sensor is basically first we have to get the GPIO, to configure the GPIO and also um, to create uh, uh, a class or an object um, that communicates over the one-wire protocol. So I told you before that uh, the temperature sensor is uh, using the one-wire bus. So these three lines uh, basically indicate that we first take the peripherals from a uh, singleton in the framework and it's really a singleton because if we take the ownership, and here comes the first um, Rust paradigm basically, we take the ownership of the peripherals. That means no other part of the application can get it. So it's strictly controlled. The compiler will check it. Um, with the peripherals, we can then uh, ask them to give us uh, a certain pin here. And we ask for GPIO3. That's the pin that I have chosen. I could have chosen anything else. And I hand this GPIO3 over to a constructor that creates an input-output pin out of it. And that means uh, I hand over the ownership. Again, no other part of my application can use GPIO3 anymore. That's dedicated uh, to this uh, input-output driver. And it goes a little bit further. So now we have configured with this constructor. We have also configured uh, the device already. Uh, we hand over this driver now to the one-wire protocol. Again, ownership concept. The GPIO3 input-output driver is handed over to the one-wire bus protocol, and nobody else can use this driver and reconfigure it to some other function anymore. So this is all that we need to communicate over the one-wire bus. Then I, I created an endless loop here. Uh, we have an embedded device, and this is the main function. We wouldn't do anything meaningful afterward anyway. So in this, main f uh, in this loop, we do a temperature measurement, and then we go to sleep for 10 seconds. We can briefly have a look if this is now up and running. Oh, no, it asks for the USB port. OK, so there's now uh, also a Rust feature, which is kind of uh, called pattern matching. You might know it from functional languages if you had some experience to that before. Um, I basically do the temperature measurement in a function, and this function returns a result. A result in Rust is a common um, return type if something can go wrong. So 
one part of the result is either the value that you expect or it's an error. And the error gives you further details what did go wrong. And there are a lot of things that can go wrong. For example, the device could not be found. Uh, there was a, a glitch on the, on the bus that the reading was not correct. And so instead of using if else statements here to uh, process the result, I'm now able to have different cases with this pattern matching. I can say, if the measurement was OK, then take the measurement and send it out. I can also say, if there was an error, but a specific error like no device found, I can give out a warning that there's no device on the bus. And for all other errors, that's a catch all, basically, I want to catch this error in this variable R, and I give it out as an error message. Because no device found might not be a hard error. It might be just, just a warning for us. And the nice thing here with this pattern matching is if I remove the last line, you see that an error appeared. And the compiler told us already that I'm not covering all the cases that I should cover. And um, this means with Rust and the pattern matching, you have to be comprehensive. You have to cover all the cases that you are supposed to cover. Of course, I can remove this line here with my specific no device found error. It's still OK, because it's still, it, it will then be handled as a, a catch-all error and outputted as an error message. So we will have a quick look at um, the send message first. And maybe first I explain the measurement. The measurement is a normal struct, means it uh, holds uh, two values. One is a device ID and one is a temperature as a float value. I have marked the structure uh, to be serializable. And uh, that's quite interesting because there's not much else needed to serialize this structure now in a format that I can send over the wire. What format is still open? And if I go back to the send function, you see that I call cert JSON, so it's the serialization, deserialization library for JSON. I call the function to string pretty to have nice indentation and line breaks and give it an object of the structure measurement. And that's all that you need. Whatever structure you have now that is serializable can be now serialized into JSON. And I send out an info message for it. Going back to my measurement function, that gets a little bit more complicated. You might have seen that the call to this function looks a little bit different than the lines above it. So I call the measure temperature function and hand over the one wire bus, bus uh, for the bus to work on. But since we are in a loop, we cannot transfer the ownership to this uh, measurement function. Because the first time we enter the loop, we would hand over the ownership of the bus to it. And the second time we go through this iteration, uh, it's not available anymore. And the compiler would complain about this. So we have to use a different concept, which is called borrowing. So we borrow this bus to this function. And when the function returned, it, uh, this main uh, function is the owner again of, of it. And we can use it further on. Um, because we want not only want to read from the bus, but also want to write to it, it has to be a mutable object that we are sharing. Uh, in Rust, everything is const by default. And if you do some Rust development, you will experience after some time that a lot of your code is actually uh, immutable. There are only a few cases where you really need mutability. And if this is not the case for your applications uh, and when you switch to Rust, then it might be uh, something that you are doing in a different way than you would normally do with Rust. So in C, C++, everything is mutable by default. But uh, what I found out is that you almost never need a mutable uh, variable. And that's, that's a pretty nice, nice learning from there. So let's go to the measure temperature function. And I basically used another library for talking to the device and uh, can start a simultaneous measurement. As I told you, you can have parallel temperature sensors uh, connected to it. And this will start a measurement of all of them. It needs uh, the one wire bus to communicate over and some time provider or delay provider because the one wire bus does some bit, uh, bit manipulation. It uh, pulls the GPIO up and down. And of course, this has to be done for, for some uh, microseconds. So we need 
uh, an object that um, provides uh, delays in microseconds. That's the ETS. And in the next line, you see we have to wait a little bit because the analog digital converter takes some time to do the measurement and convert it into a binary result. And this also needs a time provider, but that's the not so nice solution for the ESP. We have two time providers, one which provides delays greater than 10 milliseconds and the other one lower than 10 milliseconds. And if you use the wrong one, it will just return and you will not see anything about it. So I learned it the, the hard way. Um, this will take uh, 750 milliseconds. And um, once the measurements are done, we can look on the one-wire bus for some devices. And if some device was found, we take the device address, create an object of the temperature sensor, read the data, and return the measurement. So I think I told you about this uh, result type. This is how you return the result type. You wrap it in an OK state, in an OK block. And then the caller knows that this is actually what I wanted and everything went well. If it didn't go well, for example, if we didn't find a um, device on the bus, uh, we will not go into the if statement uh, and fall through and finally return an error with device not, uh, no device found. You might have you might have uh, seen the question mark at the end of some lines. Um, that's also a feature of Rust where we can do an early return in an hour case. So for example, start simultaneous um, uh, temp measurement. Oh, I don't get the help at the moment. Um, start simultaneous temp measurement also returns uh, a result. And the question mark at the end of the line means if it's okay, then continue. If it's an error, do an early return and return the error to the calling function. So we don't have to uh, ha handle uh, these cases with if-else statements um, as we would do in other languages quite often. And uh, we do it in this line. We have here in the search device a question mark. This can also go wrong. The creation of the object can go wrong, reading sensor data. So all the error handling code is basically hidden behind this uh, question mark, and that's, that's pretty nice. So let's have a look at our application on the target. It's in the background, it already started. And we see that approximately every 10 seconds, we get a new measurement. And as I told you, the object is serialized to JSON and printed as an info message uh, to the console. And it's, yeah, it's quite hot in here. And you can see, if I touch the temperature sensor, it should go up, hopefully not above 40 degrees Celsius. Let's see, and hopefully I didn't cause a shortage. Yeah, so it's increasing according to my body temperature. Let's stop here. So we do the measurement now in an endless loop. That means the CPU is active all the time. And uh, this board takes about 20 to 30 milliampere uh, current. That means um, my batteries will last, I don't know, maybe something like 10 hours and then I have to recharge, recharge them. Um, but I can do this a better way because I don't want to do the temperature measurement continuously every few seconds. It's enough for me to have it every five minutes, every 10 minutes. I can ask uh, the CPU to go into deep sleep mode. And that's also supported by the framework. Interesting that it takes so long to check out my versions. Okay. Okay. So back in the source code, there's, let's go to the main function. There's only a few changes. What you can see is basically that the loop has disappeared. So we um, initialize uh, the one wire bus, then we do the measurement as before, and then we don't loop anymore, but we call a deep sleep function that I have implemented here. Uh, <coughs> for nine seconds. And what happens with the deep sleep is that everything gets powered down on the board except for the real-time clock. The timers are configured and after nine seconds, the real-time clock uh, will tell the CPU to wake up again. And for the deep sleep, it means it goes through the reset and uh, boots from scratch. So the function deep sleep is uh, also pretty simple. 
um, I specified as a return value on an exclamation mark. Uh, that's a special signal to the Rust compiler that this function will never return. And this is the case for our deep sleep. Uh, we print out a log message and then we call some unsafe code. Who has heard about unsafe code and Rust? <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, so unsafe code means basically that this code block will not be verified by the compiler for undefined behavior. Um, ESP deep sleep is actually a C function that comes from the framework and uh, it's pretty simple to call a C function. So the language bindings are working quite nicely, but the compiler cannot check what's inside the C function. So I have to put this into an unsafe block. If I would remove it, I get, uh, yeah, get a warning from the compiler or an error uh, that this is unsafe to do it and I should uh, put a block around it. And it's more or less just a marker for other developers. If they see this code, they know there's something happening inside that will not be checked by the compiler, so the developers have to take special care that this is working uh, nicely. So, let's run this. Okay, there was a glitch on the USB cable. Let's reconnect it. And while it's flashing, I want to show you another thing that I didn't mention before. Um, so I was talking about the peripherals and that we take them. Um, taking the peripherals does not return uh, a result because there's nothing that can go wrong. But um, taking a per peripher the peripherals is something that, can, that only works once. So you get an optional result. That means the first time you get some peripherals and the second time you would call this function, you get no peripherals. And that's the option that's a little bit different from the errors. And um, we don't handle this now with the next uh, question mark, but we have to take the values out. So when we call peripherals take, we get some peripherals back and we have to extract the peripherals out of the sum. And you can do this, for example, with the unwrap. Um, unwrap call calls should, be, should not appear that often in your code and you should know uh, when to use them because it means if there is none, it will panic and reboot the CPU. But we are sure in our application here that we can take uh, the peripherals because we are actually the first one to take them. A quick look and you see it already flashed the application to the, to the board, uh, it did a temperature measurement and then it goes to power down mode for nine seconds and in you can already see that it boots from scratch again and the timing uh, starts by, by, zero, by zero. And with this change, with this simple change, I already got my uh, temperature locker uh, to run for up to three weeks. And the shorter I get this, basically, uh, the uptime, uh, the longer it will, will last. So now we go to the final part, which is sending the, sending the values out to the to the cloud. It was fast. And I will also directly start it. Oh no. Ah. Demo time. Okay. So I'll explain in a second what I just did. So the Wi Fi code, as it is part of the chip, it's well supported by the, uh, by the framework. That means there are not many steps that I have to do to initialize the Wi-Fi. Um, I basically initialize it with the right pins from the peripherals, so I hand over the modem part to the Wi-Fi driver. Again, ownership moves to this driver, nobody else can use the Wi-Fi anymore unless we give it the Wi-Fi driver. Then we start it. Inside this function, there's just a small state machine which uh, powers up the Wi-Fi module, then it waits until it's connected with the connection parameters, and um, fin finally it will return when, when it's connected to the hotspot. And then I do a hard-coded delay here, uh, which we probably want to replace by something uh, more stable, um, because I want uh, to wait until the DHPC server has given us an IP address before I can send out anything. We do the temperature measurement as before, and afterwards we wait two seconds again 
again, something to be replaced for productive code. Uh, but you want to make sure that everything is sent out uh, from the buffers and not uh, being kept in the, in the buffers and not sent over the Wi-Fi. And then we stop the Wi-Fi and go to sleep mode. That's actually something you have to uh, make sure that the Wi-Fi module is powered down and everything is in correct state before you go to the deep sleep. Um, the send function has changed a little bit. In the send function, we still have the serialization to a JSON message. We put it to the console. But we also send it now to a UDP socket. You see in this function, it doesn't know anything about Wi-Fi. It just uses the network working functions and connects to some IP address uh, and port 1337 and sends our message over the wire. One thing that I have used here is uh, this environment macro, macro. So I asked the compiler to resolve the IP address at compile time. So I don't want to um, check in the, the IP address of the server. I've done the same thing for the SSID and the Wi-Fi password. I don't want to have this available on GitHub, especially for my private ones. And yeah, that's all what, the, what we need for Wi-Fi communication. We have a quick look at it. Um, yeah, it looks good. We get some log messages for the Wi-Fi. It basically connected to the conference network here. Um, with the password in clear text on the log messages, that's fine. And then it sends out the message. Uh, but where did it end up? I have, um, let's have a quick look at the config file. You see, I have configured the environment variable here in a config file. You can also do it on the console for yourself. And this is an IP address of, um, of a virtual machine at uh, AWS that I have set up for this case. Let's have a quick look. Um, if the messages arrive. Yeah, so I do want, can I do it a little bit bigger? So, oh yeah, make this bigger. So we do a netcat listen to UDP 1337. And hopefully within 10 seconds, we should now, now get the temperature reading from this room. So, who is counting? Here it is. So we have now a fully developed um, IoT temperature sensor in Rust. There's not much code that I have developed. It was about 100 lines of code. Um, of course, I struggled a little bit with the borrow checker and uh, with the type checker, uh, but for good reasons. Um, at the beginning, I used a different temperature sensor before, because, before I found this one. And, um, the external library that I have used was not uh, up to date. It was not conforming to the, um, to the interfaces of the embedded uh, um, layers on the, on the hull. And uh, so basically the compiler guided me with complex error messages uh, through, the, through my uh, fixing process. Um, it was not that easy. It looks like C++ template error messages at the beginning until, until you get familiar. But uh, at the end, the compiler was completely right that I was missing something. There was a type mismatch. And uh, it's, it's a, it should be a tool for you and not something you should fight against. So all these uh, language features that some people are afraid of, like unsafe code, uh, like borrow checker, lifetimes, uh, strong type checking, they are tools. And you might struggle with them. It's a steep learning curve. But once you have mastered it, basically, you know that your code is more correct than before. OK, um, just one thing that I wanted to show you about Cargo. So I told you that I used some external libraries for the temperature sensor and for the bus system. Uh, with Cargo, you can also search for libraries. So if I know that I'm looking for a um, library for the one-wire bus, I can ask uh, Cargo search, and then it actually found in the registry the libraries that uh, I used in this project, so it's the one wire bus itself, and it's already um, the temperature sensor library as well. And if I want to use this in my project, I can just say cargo add, and probably it will complain because I use it already, but it's as easy as this. Um, for fast prototyping, you can directly use the cargo tool to find the libraries that you want to use. Um, 
you can add this to the project and the next time I do a cargo run, it will download the library, compile it and link it to my application. Uh, that's pretty nice, but for productive code, again, you have to check the stability of this library, if there are any CVEs available um, and if it's maintained. Okay, that's what I wanted to show you in this demo. Um, I think we have something like five minutes left uh, for questions if you have to have any. And if you have any, um, I was asked uh, that you can go to over to the microphone that the people online can listen to them. Is this possible? It's over there. Thanks for the talk. Um, ah. Does it work? Hello? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the delay function was called freeartos.delayms. So is yeah. there a free artos running and how big is your firmware image? Yeah, um, very good observation. Um, so what I have used, let's go back to the slides briefly. So what I have used, I generated the project based on the ESP IDF template. And IDF is the IoT development framework from Espressive. Um, and it's basically a pretty high abstraction layer that we have here. So uh, we have the Wi-Fi support baked in here. Uh, we have uh, all these uh, timing functions in there. And part of the IDF is free RTOS. So if I use this, I have free RTOS running. And that's why I pre-compiled it. It takes some time. Um, you can also use, uh, if you're more, uh, want, want to go into more dangerous paths, you can um, create a project from the ESP template. And then you have to go really low level. Then you have to look for some external libraries for Wi-Fi support. Uh, you have to do more initialization, like turning off the watchdog at the beginning, because watchdog is enabled by default, that your application doesn't reset after a certain amount of time. So I forgot to mention this at the beginning. So we are uh, using the IDF template, which gives us a higher abstraction layer, but also some nice features. And for drop prototyping, I would uh, recommend this. And one. Uh, special feature that we get here is that we uh, are able to use the standard library with all its functionality. And without the IDF, you wouldn't have virtual uh, dynamic memory allocation, for example. So you have to pre-allocate everything for your own. I hope this answers the question. Next, please. In your last slide, you showed the search for the single wire libraries and things, and it only showed the Dallas temperature sensor. Is this the only thing I get in the internet uh, for the single wire, or is it because you installed it? No, that's basically all it found in the registry. There might be, uh, there might be more if uh, they are written in a different way. Um, but what you can also see, uh, it found the library for the DS18 B20, and probably it's uh, referencing to the one-wire bus and some metadata. So there is some kind of a um, more extensive search than just comparing the string, uh, but that's all that I found online. And uh, I have to say, they are not uh, up to date at the moment. So when I started this project two months ago, they were working uh, directly with the um, uh, embedded hull. That's the, uh, the, the other crate, which comes automatically with the project. But the embedded hull updated some interfaces, and this library was not updated yet. So I hope this will happen in the next days or weeks. Yeah. Next, please. Um, is it possible to use uh, an async runtime like Tokyo on an embedded device instead of FreeRTOS? Yeah, that's um, also a very interesting part. So the steps from here would be um, that I want uh, to look into embedded frameworks. Uh, we have Embassy, for example, as a very popular one, which uh, provides an async framework. Uh, then we can use the async programming style, and it also gives us some kind of um, higher abstraction from, from the CPU. So when we write, my hope is that we uh, can write embedded applications based on um, embassy and then also uh, be able to be more flexible in switching the hardware below it. Uh, that's something I have to try out and haven't yet. But uh, that's definitely one of the next steps. So this is pretty simple, my example. Uh, just to show you what other things I wanted to look at, another thing is uh, UI. There is a library called Slint. Uh, which you probably can use for um, e-ink displays up to complex uh, color displays with touch screens. And I wanted also to integrate the UI, a small e-ink display with this device. Then. OK, next question, please. Yeah. Um, so as we have seen in your example, when dealing with legacy applications, uh, legacy libraries, um, you end up with unsafe uh, uh, blocks. 
And uh, in more complex uh, projects, my fear is that you end up having a lot of unsa uh, unsafe uh, sections, uh, basically losing a lot of the security benefits of Rust itself. Um, do you have any experience or uh, any gut feeling on how much that really hurts in real life, having those unsafe blocks? Or, or mm -hmm. yeah. So I think, so I have used the, the unsafe block basically because I was interfacing with a library written in C. Mm -hmm. So th that's probably the use case that you are thinking of. Um, if you're working on the level that I'm working here, so that's pretty on a, on a high application level, Uh, you shouldn't have basically any unsafe blocks if you're not interfacing with other languages. Um, if you would use the um, ESP template without the IDF uh, support, you probably have a lot more because then you have to dereference some pointers to the memory map registers. Um, I have done a couple more applications in this context. One is the backend collecting the data in the cloud and then I have a REST API that I have developed and these applications have no unsafe code at all. So my expectation is if we do productive code and have a certain abstraction layer on the, from the hardware, uh, we shouldn't have any unsafe code anymore. I mean, what I have also done is I wrapped the unsafe code into a function so that the caller of the function doesn't have to use unsafe anymore uh, because I tell the user I have developed this small function very deliberately. I check that it's working correctly. Um, yeah. You have an addition? Okay. Let's so, um, hmm? you used a uh, uh, string type in your measurement struct there, which is a heap allocated uh, type. So basically, does Cargo have some kind of uh, tool to inspect your um, memory usage, basically, on the stack or the heap? Um, that's something I actually don't know. Uh, that's something I wanted to find out. Um, I hope that, with, that I get something like this with Embassy. Um, the only thing that I have uh, is basically the image size uh, at the moment uh, for the flashing, uh, but I have no idea how much of the, um, of the RAM is being used. So this board has 300 uh, kilobyte, something like that, yeah. Um, okay. Then I have two comments uh, to, the, to the last questions. Um, to the last one with uh, respect to monitoring the flash usage, there is, for example, cargo bloat, which you can use for mm -hmm. expecting your binary um, and get uh, the individual sizes of the symbols. There is also some stack analysis, uh, stack analysis uh, stuff around, but um, not fully operational at the moment. And a comment to the question before mm -hmm. is that um, especially if you, you use the unsafe for um, going deep sleep, yep. this is um, so yeah, yeah, the ESP EDF is currently, or the, the Rust support is currently a pretty moving target. And especially deep sleep support is currently on the way of getting standardized in the ESP HAL, mm -hmm. and which will then, then go uh, down that you can use safe code for going deep sleep in the ESP EDF HAL or in the bare metal HAL. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then at the end I won't have any unsafe code anymore. Great. That's the target. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I, have a, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question regarding the interrupt contexts uh, because you mentioned that on the in the main function you initialize the peripheral and in typical embedded C uh, when you go to interrupt you need to access the peripheral. Uh, can you explain briefly how this is handled? Um, No. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, actually, I haven't uh, dealt with interrupts uh, in Rust yet. Um, that's something to look at if you want to go really deeply embedded, if you want to save a lot of um, yeah, a flash footprint, for example, and memory usage. Um, this is more like uh, an application prototype for rapid prototyping. And no, that I can't answer that today. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Any more questions? No? Then thank you for attending uh, this presentation and uh, I hope I could show you a little bit um, that Rust applications are not that difficult. Uh, you can do some rap rapid prototyping if you use the correct frameworks. And if somebody is interested to trying it out, um, there is yeah, there's the code available uh, on GitHub, exactly as I have shown it. Um, you can contact me on LinkedIn if you have any questions. And finally, if somebody has an idea what he wants to develop and has some time, I have two boards with me. Come to me, 
um, give me some feedback, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you want to do with these boards, then you can take them with you and um, program your own embedded IoT device. Thanks a lot.